Good morning and welcome. Would you please welcome Craig Madden for our Welcome to Country. Um, thank you very much, Mariam. Wujiri uh, Gamarua, good day and welcome. Uh, my name is Craig Madden, and I'd like to start by thanking the International Federation of Libraries Association for inviting me here today to welcome you onto country. I'm a proud Bunjalung Gadigal man in the Eora Nation, and the land that we stand on here today is the land of the Gadigal people. Jinyera Gadigal, this land is Gadigal. It is uh, customary for Aboriginal people as we invite guests or visitors onto our land or country that we offer you safe passage as you pass through our lands. So as a representative of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and a proud Gadigal man, I'd like to welcome you all to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. I'd like to pay my respects to our elders, past, present and emerging, and honour the stories and traditions of our Aboriginal people from this land. I'd also like to pay my respects to our ancestors as they watch down upon us as we walk upon these sacred lands. To our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, if you have any brothers and sisters from the Torres Strait Islands, welcome. To our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters here today, a warm and sincere welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. Our Gadigal clan is one of the 29 clans which make up the Eora Nation. And it's a nation that's bound by three distinct landmarks. So we've got the Hawkes River to the north, the Nupin River out to the west, and the Georges River down to the south. And within the boundaries of those mighty rivers lie our Eora Nation and the land of our Gadigal people, one of the many clans of that nation. To our guests who've traveled from across the seas, welcome. To our guests who've traveled across our great country, great states, and this magnificently beautiful city of ours, welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. Um, I hope you all enjoy the event today. On behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and its members and our Gadigal mob, for those of you who are traveling far distance this afternoon, please travel safely. Once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. And remembering that under the asphalt and the dirt, and the waterways of this beautiful country, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you. Jingari, Jimbalang. Hello, everyone. In the language of where I come from, the Kumbamere families of the Yukumbe region. I acknowledge I am on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I recognise the continuing connection to the land, waters and sky. And I'm incredibly grateful for that very, very warm welcome from Craig. Good morning. I am uh, Marion Morgan Binden. I'm the Supreme Court of Queensland Librarian and CEO. And I'm also the chair of the IFLA Library Buildings and Equipment section, a small but very mighty and, and um, very action-focused section of IFLA. And under the stewardship of Philip Kent and Margie Kirkness, I welcome you to our midterm seminar here in this beautiful city of Sydney. A special welcome to our international LBS library buildings and equipment section. Don't you love acronyms? Librarians love them. So IFLA, library buildings and equipment section. Our international um, committee members who have joined us today, to our sponsors, and to each of you who have come today to attend this seminar. Library design matters. And today we're talking about building excellence, global and Indigenous trends in library design. We have a lineup of distinguished and international speakers with topics from libraries in transformation, global trends in library furniture, and incorporating Indigenous principles into library projects. In addition to our thought-provoking speaker program, we have the library tours, which some of you have already taken part in, and there's another one this afternoon. But we also have a unique opportunity during lunchtime to um, not only speak with your colleagues, but actually to visit um, the award-winning Living Lab Classroom Native Garden, just a couple of minutes walk away. The garden was created in 2021 with staff and students partnering with Indigigrow, a local in Aboriginal-owned social enterprise to plant and create the garden. It's a tool to learn about country, with plants displayed using their Indigenous names, it offers spaces for yarning, for work, 
and rest with recycled furniture and laptop power. It's just a few minutes down the road and Margie will talk about that a bit later in the day. So the library buildings and equipment section recognises the importance of the relationship between library buildings and their capacity to strengthen our communities, both physically and socially. In more than a little over two centuries, libraries have become truly ubiquitous across the nation and across the world. And over that time, they've grown and evolved far beyond the imagination of those early visionaries who saw the potential in providing spaces and resources. But when they looked back, they would see that things have changed very little. So as we step into even the most architecturally and technologically advanced of library buildings today, I think these library pioneer, pioneer, <clears throat> excuse me, would recognize the core purpose and values of the incredible movement that they started all those years ago. Our libraries, no matter what type, and everyone's represented here today, are the beating heart of the communities they serve. They're spaces that bring people together. And more importantly, they're also agents of social change. They have the potential to be places that inspire and uplift and create and reflect the communities that they serve. The library paradigm is also a knowledge society, providing opportunities for inquiry, inspiration and learning. And today you will have that opportunity. What will inspire you today? What questions will this seminar evoke? I look forward to your conversations. I look forward to your questions and your reflections on today. And would you please welcome the chair of our morning session, Margie Kirkbess. Thank you, Marion. I'm delighted and privileged to be one of your co-hosts for today, along with my colleague from the University of Sydney, Philip Kent, and chairing this morning's session. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Thank you. Um, I also acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which our libraries are built. Um, and I acknowledge any First Nations people that are here with us today. So I'm really delighted this morning to be welcoming our keynote speaker, Annie. Um, I know, Annie, that you've got a huge portfolio of work in cultural buildings, community buildings, and a special passion for libraries. You bring with you a lot of expertise and experience, and we're really looking forward to hearing where you think libraries are up to in an international sense, and just starting off our day, setting up our day with a really good start, um, setting the scene for this morning's session and, in fact, the whole day. So please give a warm welcome, everyone, to Annie Hensley from FJMT Studio. Can you hear me? I'm really delighted to be here. There are actually, given my portfolio, quite a number of my excellent librarian clients in the room, which makes me feel very at home. Um, but I'm also really delighted that people have come from across the seas, um, particularly from New Zealand. So when I actually talk about some of our um, New Zealand projects, please forgive my pronunciation of Maori terms. I try. Um, and here we go. Hopefully it's this that does it. So talking with Margie, uh, I decided to have a go at what the latest trends in libraries are. This is obviously a, a brief overview of them. And I'm really looking at the extremes of what these trends are doing. There are multitudes of wonderful buildings in between um, that are doing great things, medium-sized libraries, um, just your day-to-day -day branch libraries. But I was really interested to see where these extreme trends go. So I'm talking about hyper-local and hyper modification. So we also acknowledge um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples um, and the Eora Nation um, whose ties to the Sydney Basin extend through millennia and continue into the future. We would also like to extend 
um, our acknowledgement to Indigenous people globally, which is one of the things that's been so important with um, IFLA's advocacy, recognising their human rights and freedoms as articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So I think this one is really something that we're starting to focus on in library design. And I'm going to do a thing that is actually quite um, common in New Zealand in particular, and I think we should do it more here. It's called positioning, which is why am I here and where did I come from? Well, I am here because I'm an architect. I chose a studio that really focuses on public benefit, on um, place-specific design and design for community. Um, and obviously our focus from that is um, particularly on libraries uh, being a passion. Um, and that's why I'm here today to talk about that. Um, but where do I come from? Well, I don't really come from here, do I? Um, so in terms of positioning, I, uh, my ancestry is European. It's English, Scottish, Irish, German, Jewish. Um, and we came to Australia and my relative affluence, my education, um, has been to the detriment of First Nations people in Australia. So I acknowledge that and I work very hard now to um, reinforce the rights of First Nations people and um, embed their culture in, in buildings as much as we possibly can. So um, just a bit of housekeeping. FJMT has just become FJC Studio, if you see it around, uh, recognising the leadership of our managing principal, um, Elizabeth Carpenter. So wonderful to have also a female lead in our studio. Um, I would also like to thank IFLA for inviting me to this. I have an enormous passion um, for uh, the advocacy of IFLA, uh, whether it be Indigenous rights, whether it be design excellence um, and lifelong learning. And this building here uh, actually won the IFLA Award many years ago, the Craigie Byrne, um, the Hume Library and Learning Centre. Um, and it was a really tricky design because there was no community there at the time. It was actually about to become housing development. But of course, now we know there has always been community there. Um, and so some Danish gentlemen turned up at the library and uh, went for a tour and we won that very prestigious award. And we're still very proud of that. Um, what I wanted to talk about firstly is this increasing um, modification of architecture, uh, particularly uh, the perceived value of the star architect, uh, who is a star architect, um, and they are increasingly designing um, the, the homes of cultural institutions um, and particularly of corporations. And the question is, why is that concerning? And we'll go through that in a little bit of detail. Um, and so my exploration begins with a, a bit of a look at um, the World Architecture Festival Awards because really they, they look at international architecture all over the world and really are seen as the sort of peak awards uh, for architecture um, and just see what architects think are great design buildings. Now, some of these are obviously libraries, um, but they're all sorts of different types of buildings. And the one that won the World Building of the Year last year was actually one down at Circular Quay by 3XN, Key Quarter. It is an enormous refurbishment of the large AMP building uh, at Circular Quay, but it also includes a large amount of ground plane and a whole precinct with heritage buildings, etc. cetera. Um, what we see of this is it is an international architect who built it um, and it has uh, supersized the area um, of the building uh, to increase its value. But then if you look at the two little pictures down on the right-hand side, you will see a very small library in China, uh, in Ping Tan, um, a gorgeous little bespoke thing in a village, and also a landscape of the year, which reinforced um, some beautiful um, and, and rehabilitated rural landscapes in, in China. So the diversity of those two things is extraordinary. And that's what I'm really talking about here. The, the supersized commodified architecture and then the super local, uh, which is really um, being recognized a lot, particularly in architecture awards. So this beautiful little Ping Tan library by a company called Condition Lab. It's in a little village, um, it's for children. And it really reinforces the vernacular architecture of that area. Uh, it's all done at a very budget kind of architecture, but so, so very thoughtful. 
uh, and really aligned to children and how they like to explore. There are little holes that you can get in and out. Uh, the beautiful timber framing of the building uh, brings such warmth. Um, and what it's really doing is it's actually really celebrating what is important about Chinese culture in villages. Um, and I really love the fact that this tiny building uh, has got the same kind of presence as the enormous 3XN building at Circular Quay. Um, and it is a bit like this really famous library that came out about 10 years ago, the Li Yuan Library, um, which was also a very local um, uh, kind of response. And interestingly and ironically, um, it's become a destination. <laughs> so with Instagram, with, you know, the proliferation of images, you can't actually even really use it as a local library anymore because people visit it en masse. Um, but again, you know, this, this ability to say we, we have our own culture, we have our own environment, our own beautiful context, um, and we should celebrate that wherever we can. So returning to 3XN's key quarter, uh, the values of star, star architecture um, have really um, played a role in city branding. Uh, so if it, anyone knows the Bilbao famous art gallery, that was really I think the beginning of the Star Architect era, and that's quite a, a long time ago now. And now there are a whole series of international architects who do these gobsmacking buildings all over the world. Um, and it's perceived as bringing greater value to buildings um, and also you know, improving urban and economic effects um, by, by selecting these architects. That's not to say that they haven't tried really hard, the developer to do a beautiful place-centric ground plane. Um, which includes some wonderful artworks by Jonathan Jones. I highly, highly recommend you go and have a look at them. They're just beautiful, like the clusters of oysters on the sandstone wall. Um, but it really is part of this, this wider trend. And for those who live in Sydney, um, this is uh, Cockle Bay, which you might go and visit uh, if you're a visitor. Um, and the vast proportion of buildings that are being built there uh, by international architects, it's Wilkinson Air, it's Renzo Piano, uh, it's Rogers Sturck, um, it's Snow Heta. Um, so really, uh, you can see that the vast proportion of the shoreline is now all international star architects. You'll see these two little Australian ones. That one's ours. We got, we got one. <laughs> we got one little building in there. <laughs> Um, and, you know, uh, just, just to be honest, we have been in the competitions for a lot of these um, and we've lost them all. So no sour grapes there. But then I guess when we're talking about the star architect and supersizing, we will be talking more about this building, which is by an excellent company, Schmidt Hammer Larsen, and really they are the um, absolute experts in libraries. And they are undertaking some enormous buildings around the world, including this one uh, in East Shanghai, um, which, which is of a scale which is just gobsmacking. I think it's over 100,000 square metres of space. Uh, and when you're talking about these supersized institutions, you're also starting to question how, how do you bring meaning and human scale, which is so, so important in libraries to these large institutions. Um, and then just because that one was 100,000 square metres, this one, uh, which has just been commissioned in Wuhan, is going to be 140,000 square metres, which is, um, I, I can't even conceive of what you put in a building of that scale. Uh, but obviously very large populations in China and getting some very, very large um, commissions for, for libraries. Um, so... Why, why are we highlighting these things? I guess what we're saying is that when we're doing this architecture or if we're experiencing um, architecture, what's happening now is that there's this overwhelming amount of information and stimulation and simulation and indiv individualization and speed, um, but there is less sense of community, of place, because there's so little time to build these buildings. And so this is something that um, you should, uh, my director, Richard Francis Jones, has just written a book um, called Truth and Lies in Architecture. And he really does talk about that quandary for architects of 
I, I, I really want to care. I really want to put the time into understanding the community to have a, an authentic response. But it, it all is under so much pressure that often you don't end up really um, delving down as much as we'd like to as architects. Um, and so what happens with this is that there's this sense of placelessness. Um, there's this dislocation and lack of meaning, which, you know, really a library is the, the place-centric grounding place that people go to. Um, and I'm not focusing on China particularly, other than the fact that they, they've built most of the libraries recently. <laughs> um, and so I just, I just thought this was interesting with the, the varied star architects who, who build in China and do these enormous buildings. Um, how are they trying to apply meaning? Um, and a lot of those architects are really trying to apply meaning. Um, but, you know, you do question sometimes whether there's, there's enough application of, of embedding culture in these buildings. So um, SHL's building is based on the idea of, of a rock. Um, the, the I by um, MVRDV. Uh, this one could be interesting when it's finished. The Ginkgo Forest um, by Snoheta. Um, and then Cloudscape up on the right uh, is um, by Mad Architects. And then down the bottom is the, the next huge building um, by MVRTV, which is talking about canyons. So, you know, they're, they're strong ideas, but um, in terms of embedding local culture, I think it's really difficult um, with these very large um, and very time um, pressured buildings. So I'll just read this little bit from Richard in his book. The architect then weighed down and disempowered by unreasonable demands, regulations, committees and contracts, intense pressures of cost, time and construction processes, vested interest, opinion, consultation and good taste is largely silent on issues of substance and all too often relegated to the creative generation of competitive marketable images for, well, Instagram. Um, so, you know, some of these buildings, it's interesting, would not be able to be designed in Australia. <laughs> uh, they don't comply with codes. Um, but, you know, the lusciousness of the Instagrammable um, building is, is very clear. Um, and what you see um, if you are working in a library is that a lot of those um, levels of books you can't actually access uh, without stepping up and stepping down, let alone having arguments about whether you use the bottom shelf. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, all the books that are above a certain height are just images. So it really is about the image of a library. And you get these repeating um, elements of, you know, the, the amphitheatre. Yes, we do amphitheatres too. Um, and, and these sinuous shelves and the shelves up to, you know, four storeys up in the air. Um, and a lot of that is about imagery and repetition of imagery. Then at the other side of this is what I'm calling hyperlocal. Um, and these libraries vary enormously from proper branch libraries through to little school libraries. Um, and as you can see, it's really about craft. It's about celebrating um, the context, the environment, the natural materials of the area. Um, the talents of the community. Um, and this gorgeous little one uh, in India, the Maya Samaya Library, um, is by an architect. Uh, his name is actually Samit Padora, who does beautiful architecture, which really is trying to return to craft. Um, and he does some really innovative things with that, including this extraordinary roof columnless roof, uh, which is layers of brick. So literally working on the principles of archways and, and tension and pressure uh, to create this very handcrafted little library. But over, over in the Czech Republic, another thing that's important is collective memory. Um, and so we try not to demolish buildings that are really strong in the collective memory of communities. And we did that at, at uh, Bankstown Library, for example. You know, we, we, we understood that that town hall was very um, important to uh, the local community and to Paul Keating. And um, we um, reused it. And it really does 
remain in the collective memory, even though it's now become a library and a theatre. So this one's a little rectory. And one of the things I love about it is just the respect for detailing, the respect for materiality, heritage ways of putting buildings together that has taken care and love and really does use the natural materiality to, to complement the heritage of the building. And equally in Belgium, and I can't say this word, but fund, fundamentally it was a, a, a very large cloister um, and it was renovated with a whole series of collaborating architects. Um, look at that beautiful courtyard, it's just fantastic. So it's been brought to public use now. And the level of detailing, the integration between the heritage and, and, the, and, the, um, and the contemporary insertions is just so beautiful. Um, I, I could put up dozens of images of this one. Um, but again, it's that, that reinforcement of place, that reinforcement of collective memory um, and of value. And this one that was um, at, at the header, uh, there are some people doing fascinating things with bamboo. Um, you might have seen the Bali architect on one of the um, uh, Apple channels. Um, but this one in Chiang Mai is just a little school library with this extraordinary ceiling, all made by hand out of bamboo um, and probably at minimal budgets, as you can see from the lights. Um, but such an extraordinary um, result. So why are we drawn to these libraries which embed culture, craft and history? Do we yearn to connect with culture, uh, with the communal making of things, uh, to understand the meaning and significance of a site through collective memory, to share common stories, to enjoy an authentic response to country and climate? and connecting with country, which you might have all started to hear about, which is the government architects um, draft framework, um, is fundamentally um, requiring architects to consider First Nations um, design in, in our, our buildings. Um, and what is needed there is the time to authentically engage with traditional custodians, to really understand the site, to engage with community and the site, to share stories, um, and then embedding and showcasing that skill and knowledge. Um, and also about healing environment. We really enjoy, you know, sort of trying to consider healing um, ecosystems. And you'll get to see the amazing Shannon Foster this afternoon, hear from her. Uh, and we work with her, she's a Darawal um, elder. Um, and she also has extraordinary knowledge about botany um, and ecosystems and actually works with Indigigra. Um, and obviously, being an IFLA conference, I wanted to just highlight the advocacy that IFLA is doing um, in relation to promoting and safeguarding um, culture and heritage. And you may think that that's really about the collections uh, or your programs, but it should transfer just as much into the actual environment of the library as well. Um, and so... Uh, I thought some of the, the, the quotes out of this were really interesting. Um, libraries are increasingly engaged across a wider range of tangible and intangible forms of expression. And the most important one, of course, is the expression of the building itself. You know, the first thing you actually see. Um, and showcasing artistic skills. We really love to in, embed um, art into our buildings, but it shouldn't be a slap on. It really does need to be part of the, the making of the building. Um, a part of co-design. Um, and as the key cultural infrastructure of any community, it has an obligation, I believe, to reinforce First Nations culture. And then there's that lovely idea of being the guardian um, of the memories of the world. Well, um, yes, as you saw from the European and Asian ones, those memories, that collective memory of heritage, but also the memories of millennia of, um, of uh, occupation in, in Australia. So I'm just going to give you a, a couple of examples. I'm not going to focus on too many libraries, particularly not New Zealand, because I understand we've got some wonderful New Zealand speakers coming up. Um, but I did want to talk about our first experiences of connecting with country, uh, which was the Toyo Tamaki um, Auckland Art Gallery. 
And it was uh, I, way before connecting with country became a framework in Australia. And New Zealand being bicultural means that there was a, a really strong obligation to work with um, Maori people to develop this very important public building. Um, and it took care and it took deep listening um, and it, it um, took a lot of time. <laughs> Um, but one of the wonderful things about this building is, despite the fact that we are Australian architects, it has been embraced um, by New Zealand and Maori people. So uh, what are some of the things that we uh, referenced into this design or embedded in the design? Well, one of the first things is the creation story, uh, the Maori creation story, which talk about the, the woman and the man coming together together. Uh, the woman as the land, the man as the sky, and then the child being the tree, trying to push them apart. It's a bit racy. <laughs> and uh, you, can, you can see it right here. You can see the tree. You can see the very strong ground plane. You can see the presence of the sky and the tree pushing between um, the, the land um, and the sky. Um, the tree in the background is called a Putukawa tree. Uh, it is sacred to the Maori people. Um, and the canopies of that building uh, reinforce the form of the Putukawa tree. Um, and you get these lovely reflections between the natural tree and the canopies um, as you walk around the building. The columns are carved by Ma Maori elders um, in the tradition of the extraordinary wood carving of Maori people. Um, and there are a series of wonderful um, artworks embedded in the building, including all the thresholds into the building. Uh, into the galleries, um, which are to do with um, Malatikanka, uh, which is, you know, welcome, welcome and passing through. Um, and then the ceilings were made of sacred kauri from a fallen forest um, by local boat builders. And this one's really interesting, the, to, damn it, <laughs> ta, ta, te ao marama. <laughs> I had it before, uh, which is the Auckland Museum. Um, and this was a relatively modest commission, but um, fundamental in decolonizing this very colonial building. Uh, and the importance in, in New Zealand culture of mana whenua, which is fundamentally the ownership of land, the rights of that land, but also providing hospitality for guests coming onto that land. Um, and that is an essential part of any um, development of a building. And you couldn't get a more colonial building than that. Um, so needless to say, despite the fact that it was housing incredibly important um, uh, Maori and Pacific Islander culture, um, it was very colonial indeed. Um, and it sat on a very significant hill uh, to the Maori people um, and had fundamentally occupied it. Here it is in its development. And so we undertook uh, the, these interventions to really uh, strengthen the Maori culture in the building. We cleaned up the corridors that led from the en entry through to the Maori court um, and within those corridors are a whole series of different things that really explain culture um, as you um, head towards the court. And then this existing, um, uh, I've just forgotten the name of it, it will come back to me, bowl-like shape um, has, has been sort of revealed um, and a, a new space created underneath. So this is what it looked like originally. And here is what it became. And the ceiling is uh, part of uh, the, the astrology of um, New Zealand. And then the entry is really enforced. Here are the pathways going from that um, entry through to the Maori court. There it is, the Hotanui. And the atrium itself cleared of those slightly strange stairs um, was reinforced by a whole series of blades and columns that had a footprint um, that looked like the nautilus shell. So the pa paper nautilus is a very important thing to Maori uh, people and Pacific Island people. Um, and we use those shell-like shell forms to create these sculpted um, blades and columns. 
and you can see this very important entry threshold um, now into the building uh, that reinforces um, Mana Whenua and also uh, arrival and greeting. And you can see also these the, the embedded of uh, embedded nature of sort of biophilic spiral shapes um, that, that are evident in so many natural forms. And there are the entry doors that were carved by a well-known um, Maori uh, carver. And one of the wonderful things about this is that we, we did really take this on ourselves to do this after we had undertaken Auckland Art Gallery, um, working with um, the, the Maori board. Um, but one of the extraordinary things is how, how incredibly well it's been embraced by Maori people. Um, and that really we have actually managed to regain ownership of this site for Maori people and for Maori use. And this one is quite contentious but wonderful. Uh, this is the cutaway. I'll just check in my time. How long have I got? Okay, good. Um, the cutaway is a space that most of you would know. If you, if you haven't been to Sydney, it is a strange area because once there was a... a headland that to, to the west of Circular Quay, Miller's Point, um, which was completely erased um, to make way for container terminals. Um, extraordinary. They just took away um, a whole point of um, Sydney Harbour. Um, so it was slashed. It was wounded. Um, it's had a difficult history because it was actually pinpointed at one point to be uh, a First Nations cultural centre, and through politics that hasn't happened. So that was a difficult brief to walk into. Um, we immediately started to engage with Shannon Foster, who is a connecting with country um, and uh, expert and traditional custodian. Um, and she had some wonderful ideas about this space um, and how to try and heal this space. And I'm really sorry that these things have happened. I should have done a better PowerPoint. Um, but one of the wonderful things is this idea of saltwater country and these cave-like forms eroded over centuries by wind and rain, uh, the sandstone um, caves, which are called gibbergonians, which were part of the shelter uh, in the Sydney Basin. Um, and people talk in the early colony of going up the harbour and seeing the twinkling lights of all these caves, the glowing of all these caves that were being used for shelters. Um, important as shelter, but also as a hearth. You'd put your fire in there. It was a signifier of habitation. Oops, on computer. So we took this incredibly rigid orthogonal space that sits underneath that um, artificial parkland and really wanted to make it um, organic again, um, to make it look like a carved out gibbagunya. Um, but also that lovely interface that you see in the Sydney Harbour of, of the caves and then the canopies of the trees, the angophoras and the gums that sort of interface um, with those, those caves and the idea that those rigid columns would then become uh, damon, which are the Port Jackson figs, which are very important knowledge trees, and eat their roots into, drive their roots into the sandstone um, cliff faces. Um, and you can also see with this uh, ceiling, this timber ceiling that we were creating uh, that flanked the ceiling and also the, the columns, that we were trying to reinforce this idea of um, shelter. So the gunya, which is a stick shelter or a wood shelter, um, has that sort of ribbing. And then this is just fantastic. This is Shannon's granddad, who was a ceremony man uh, from La Perouse. Um, and he used to do these extraordinary dances and his body markings were fish skeletons, which was um, something that was highlighted for, um, as of importance for the Darawal people. And then some people might have seen this at the last Switch conference, so I won't spend too much time on it, but this is working with Auntie Carolyn Briggs, the Boon Warong down in, in Melbourne. Again, we had this problem of a place that was placeless, um, so Narra Warren uh, is actually Kath and Kim country, if anyone knows Kath and Kim. Fountain Gate Mall is right there, right next to uh, the site, and it's just big box retail. Uh, so it was very difficult to 
identify community, to identify heritage, to identify anything that felt like identity. Um, but of course, there's always been identity here uh, with the Boon Warung people. Uh, and their creator spirit is uh, the Bunjil, the eagle hawk. And we had this notion of his protecting wings, creating a place uh, for people in Narrawarren. And so we took a big risk um, during the competition. I don't think we'd do it this way um, now, uh, which was to um, interpret uh, these creation stories and uh, win a competition based on Aboriginal culture. The best way to do it, of course, is to start with Aboriginal people, but you can't during, during a, a competition, which is one of the trickiest things to do with um, the design excellence provisions and competitions, because you're in a vacuum. Um, and there you can see it, the wings uh, that protect not only uh, a whole range of um, facilities underneath and this um, gathering foyer, uh, which is a sort of indoor public space, but also the library, uh, theatre, etc., cetera, um, are all in that space underneath as well. And there is his legs coming down. And you can see there's <laughs> not an awful lot there um a lot of uh residential but then we also thought of connecting a whole series of different paths that could come to this place from the mall from local residences uh from the oval and have a node of gathering place um in the middle of this connection which you can see developing here and we we riffed off uh, another Boon Warung artist's um, design uh, by Kathy Adams called The Meeting of Many Paths, which was based in this area. And you can see it translating into our skin, um, sheltered by the, the wings of the bunjil. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about New Zealand because we will have some great New Zealand speakers, but needless to say, there are some wonderful, um, uh, libraries that embed Maori culture all over the place in New Zealand. They really do a wonderful job and they have for a very long time. Um, this one's reasonably new by Warren and Marnie um, and they were gifted the name which was an unobstructed, unobstructed trail to the world and beyond. But the creation stories of the natural environment near this library which was a, a flat riverbed um, but then gouging through a gorge uh, are carefully embedded in the library um, by this sort of watery, very long um, LED screen that, that um, passes through the library. And some really lovely embedding of significant um, Maori graphics. And just one more, um, which is Canada. Um, Canada is also heading that way. I think New Zealand is well ahead of Canada. Um, and Canada has had, obviously, some very fraught times with their First Nations people, as we have. Um, but this, this is really lovely. This is a collaboration between um, a First Nations uh, female architect um, and a local Toronto office. And it's the idea of modernizing typologies from Indigenous architecture. And uh, the building's location is on treaty land. So I think it's really important that that, that is considered. Um, and, and the uh, First Nations architect is also um, from that land. One of the things that's really touching about this is actually that now that there is a mandate um, coming out of uh, the commission relating to the residential uh, school system in, in Canada, uh, there's a, a mandate to embed um, Maori culture, uh, sorry, uh, Northern American Indigenous arc, uh, culture into buildings. And it's really quite beautiful. There's, um, I can't wait to see it finished. There's the idea of the roundhouse, which is a, a gathering architecture typology. And then one more, uh, which is Saskatoon. Um, again, I'd be really interested to see how this one turns out. Um, it's a longhouse. Um, as you can see, which is a typology as well. Um, and then it's really got this, some people were saying TP, it start, sounds a little bit too, um, yeah, uh, stereotypical to me, but I think it could be a really lovely building. 
and room for smudging, which is a bit like smoking in, in, in Aboriginal culture of cleansing and actually being able to do that inside. So where did we get to with all of that? Um, I think what I'm trying to say is that libraries more than any other space have the ability to ground people in their place and in their community. Um, and with the commodification of architecture, there is this danger that you can create a, a, an exceptionally beautiful building such as Zaha Hadid's building um, in Baku, but you don't know where you are. Um, and I think what, what needs to be considered with the development of new libraries is how important is that to actually um, reflect a community and a culture and a, and a context. Um, and we were ac actually quite astounded because we were up against Zaha's building at the World Architecture Festival, our little art gallery versus Zaha Hadid Architects. We won. <laughs> In fact, we ended up with the world building of the year, uh, which was incredibly humbling. Um, and that was more to do with the fact that we did a very important process um, with First Nations people. And people could really identify that this is, could be nowhere else but New Zealand, nowhere else but that part of New Zealand. Um, and uh, the the local response has been really amazing in terms of uh, people's sense of ownership of the building. And just last year, here's another one, um, another um, New Zealand building very embedded in Maori culture uh, that won also a World Architecture Festival. I think it was for a commercial building. So people are focused on it. And I think, you know, if you ever got to a point where you had the um, luck of and stress of having to do a, a new library building. Um, yes, I'm looking at some of my clients here. Um, the, the ability to work with First Nations people um, should really be considered as a great opportunity. And that is about me, I think. Did I, did I run on time? <laughs> If you'd like to stay up here, Annie, we'd like to, um, first of all, thank you, but also to provide you all with the opportunity to ask some questions and we will have some, some roving mics. I think it was fascinating start to the day to hear your perceptions around the hyper -com commodification and the hyper local. Um, we often see the, the big budget, the big budget buildings um, that win prizes. But you know, I am pleased to say, as as a member of the um, IFLA Public Library of the Year Awards panel, that 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 when we're looking at, at, at judging, we do try and look at criteria that talk about. Um, what the building does with the local community and so it's it's you know it's not only the big budget buildings that um, give back to the community um, so thank you you've given us lots of food for the for thought and I think you've also set us up really well for the discussions and speakers for the rest of the day uh, with your references to the importance of First Nations people so that's really marvellous thank you um, I'm just going to kick off with um, while you're thinking of your questions I'm just going to kick off with one for you um, do you, we've, we've seen those extremes of really big buildings and really little buildings. Lots of people in the room will maybe have building projects coming up where they don't have the big budgets. Before they engage in architecture in those early stages, what, what's your best advice for them around focusing on their local? Um, I think there's a whole range of things that we try and look at for all all size projects. Um, if you do have local Aboriginal stakeholders that you engage with regularly, um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to um, embed stories of, of the, the, the country into your building. That could be through artwork, it can be through words, um, it can be through reinforcing language. I mean, one of the most important things is keeping um, Indigenous languages going. Um, I think you can also really reach out to find out what, who, are there great craftspeople um, in your area? Uh, can you showcase things that people do incredibly well? Can you showcase 
um, as we're hoping to do at, at Liverpool, um, the, the incredible artefacts of, of that area. And, you know, it doesn't mean putting them in a window, which I know a lot of librarians just, you know, what am I going to put in this window? Um, but actually embedding it into the building, you know, through, through we, we were thinking maybe some of the old lace and, and um, turning that into a graphic that is then the decals, the safety strips for, for the building. And then we're also thinking of embedding um, uh, local stories uh, just in, in the walls, in the glazing, um, maybe using the time capsule that the Liverpool Library's just done at Warrawong. Where are you, Mark? I saw you. There is. <laughs> um, we're working through an interpretation and public art strategy. Um, it's a very strong Darawal area. Uh, it's close to the Five Islands. We're having a um, little discussion right now whether, so Shannon Foster will say Warrawong means many birds. Uh, there are bird references. Um, we will actually um, embed um, artifacts. We'll, we'll actually um, mission works by, by local Aboriginal people. So the Kumadichi organisation is nearby. Uh, lots of artists there. And it's not just murals. You know, we've got this thought that maybe over the kids area, there, there are these beautiful, I mean, weaving is really strong. So there are these beautiful, crazy fish made out of um, reeds that we'd li like to suspend as part of the artwork um, and lighting in the kids area. Um, sky's the limit, really. Uh, but if you can make contact with local Aboriginal um, uh, organisations and just find out what's available. Um, there are also, as you know, um, a, a lot of really good Aboriginal children's books that, that have beautiful artwork, they have beautiful words, and you can actually reach out to those, those authors. Um, yeah. That's Thank you, points. Annie. That's great. <laughs> now, we do have roving mics available. Would you like to put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question, please? <laughs> Hi, Annie. You mentioned um, not making the involvement an add-on. Yeah. But how late in the project is too late? Exactly. It's not too late. And, and that's... I think uh, both Warrawong and Liverpool were um, at a time during COVID where it was it was very tricky to engage. We have actually managed to engage more with First Nations people. It's been an easier path um, for Warrawong, um, but they, you know, we're, we're still working out finishes, aren't we, at the moment? So we're still there. There are ways that it can really be embedded, even after the fact. You know. You, you, it doesn't have to, it could be um, also supporting Aboriginal um, industry, you know, who are making fantastic furniture, fantastic fabrics. Um, and also it's not that difficult to have a, a really great graphic turned into an, a, a hard-wearing upholstery. So the next time you're doing your big refurb of all the uh, chairs, rather than just getting your normal stuff, your Warwick fabric, why don't you go a little, for, sorry, Warwick, you know, you make some great fabrics, but, but maybe think a little outside the square about what you could actually do to, to reinforce um, local culture. Mm. Thank you. And I think we've got another question down here. Thank you so much, Annie. That was a beautiful um, presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you think it is possible to combine that sort of hyperbole of the massive scale with a very locally embedded, uh, you know, local culture, local craft, local community, very much centered on people and the usability by those people. Do you think it is actually possible to bring both together? And if so, how? <laughs> well, um, as I was saying, the, the design requirements now for design excellence in the city of Sydney um, includes um, working with the government architects, um, uh, Connecting with Country Framework, which Shannon, who you will be presenting, uh, is part of, who helped um, author. Um, and all of those, almost all of those buildings are over $200 million. So um, at a large scale, it is completely possible to embed um, uh, culture from the very beginning. Um, so some of the things that we've tried in some of the com competitions, some we've failed, some we haven't, 
uh, working with Shannon in building down near the Haymarket. Um, that area is saltwater country going into freshwater. It was where black wattles came from, uh, which aren't actually wattles at all, as Shannon will say, but they are the most beautiful serrated leaf. And so even though we're doing these huge facades where we're sort of reflecting the serrated leaf and the veins underneath the leaf in the sockets of, um, you know, all the openings, um, we're drawing ecosystems through the building. So um, another thing Shannon will talk about is how the understory has disappeared for smaller creatures, particularly small birds. So they can't get from one place to another because they can't fly that far. And she's been doing that work, particularly in Green Square. Um, but if you can create some urban landscapes that actually allow that little bird to hop along and get to the next bit, you start to heal country. Um, there are all sorts of things at the massive scale where, you know, the whole tower might be symbolising something. I think we've done towers that symbolise a shield or symbolise if they're relevant, but it should go all the way through the building. It should go into the finer grain of the detailing and the landscape. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, one over here. Thank you. Just hold it. Thank you. Um, you spoke about, and you gave the example of doozing um, Indigenous artworks on fabrics. Yeah. How would you avoid the tokenism or the sort of contrast between using those things in a space that is very non-Indigenous, so take a very corporate space and embed them? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of Aboriginal creators uh, get a little bit fed up with the fact that they think that all of their graphics are just terribly, terribly souvenir style. Um, you know, tokenistic. Whereas, you know, the, the sophistication of a lot of those those designs um, mean that they fit beautifully in 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 you know highly corporate environments as well. It's just a matter of cho choosing what you you want to choose. Um, and you know, in some of those situations, you might not necessarily be uh, trying to express the country of that locale but you're doing something else which is reinforcing, um, you know, the economies of First Nations people, which is just as important um, as connecting with country. Yeah. Thank you. And that brings to, oh, do we have one more? One quick one. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I have a particular interest and in involvement in various sort of precinct planning projects and master planning and things like that. Um, and, you know, these, these buildings are obviously really important social infrastructure overlays. Um, and I was wondering if um, what sort of trends you're seeing when it comes to buildings of that nature and the way they're thought about in those precincts um, and how we think we start to think about co-locating activities um, and bringing different social aspects into libraries and maybe some really successful examples of that. Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> so if, if we start with the precinct planning, I think, um, again, with Shannon, uh, we, we have been working on the Black Wattle Bay Master Plan um, and she did a connecting with country framework for that, which will test the, will, will sort of stay with the project well beyond the master plan phase and into the, the actual creation of those buildings. So it's a series of principles that can be used at different levels of detail. Um, when it comes to the, the multi-use side of things, I think probably the, um, the uh, Auckland Museum was a really interesting example because there, were, there was no brief to turn that area um, under the tunnel. There it is, I found it, that word, under the tunnel into anything other than a, uh, you know, a, an entry foyer space. Um, and what we've actually managed to do is embed culture well enough so that um, Maori people feel welcome, they feel a sense of ownership, um, and so they should. They should be, a, so part of um, uh, mana whenua is that you have rights to use those spaces. And I really think it should be the same in Australia, that you know, we, we plonk our buildings on it and you say, you can't come in, but a multifunctional space that feels welcoming for First Nations people where First Nations people can gather, um, can undertake ceremonies, can just hang out, should really be considered. Um, and, and certainly I think some of 
for example, the criticisms of Bunjil Place uh, were, you know, how, how did you create something that uh, Boon Warong feels happy to use at any time? Um, our response was, well, it was really early um, in, in that sort of engagement with First Nations people. We had a very strict um, area requirement. We weren't allowed a square metre more than what was in the brief. Um, but it is welcoming to all people inside and out. Uh, but I think we could go to the next phase. Thank you, Annie. Again, yeah, lots of great inspiration, lots of great food for thought, Annie. And I'd like you to join me in another round of applause for Annie. Thank you.